Today's video is sponsored by Describe. Whether you're a veteran DM or someone looking to write and run their first campaign, Describe.com, spelled D-S-R-Y-B.com, is an incredible resource that everyone should check out. One of the challenges of being a DM is writing great descriptions to provide stunning imagery for your players. When I first started DMing, I would feel weird describing what my players were looking at. So if you are new to DMing and you share that exposition shyness, you can use over 1,500 beautifully written descriptions of places, monsters, spells, characters, and more being added daily to help you craft your campaign. If you're already a great DM, use Describe to save time or find inspiration for your next location or NPC. Create your world and use Describe to help bring it to life. Now what you're here for. Player and DM plot the perfect revenge against a creepy player. Hi everyone, All Things D&D &D is back with another story. This story was submitted by our viewer Elise. This one is tough. On one hand, the player in question was a problem that was awful and inappropriate. But on the other, his actions also led to some very interesting gameplay and plot twists. I'll need you to tell me what you think after listening to this. There are plenty of stories about players mixing badly. People fight, people leave, and otherwise amazing campaigns get tainted by the unfortunate events of real-life interaction. This story is mine, and it's the series of blood-boiling actions taken by a fellow player with the ego the size of a kaiju that led to the downfall and premature death of a two-year-long campaign. Four years ago, I was playing a Pathfinder campaign with a few friends I had made online. Let's call them Cleric, Wizard, and DM, since those are their favorite roles to be in concerning tabletop roleplay games. We would do our sessions over a Discord voice call and sometimes write out character interactions in the group chat messaging threads in a turn-by-turn roleplay style. We eventually found out that the gods were dying due to a hole in the ground that was a gateway to hell, the crack in the Earth's core that was shielded by a magical barrier, dutifully named the Fracture. Our goal as players was to find the blessings of the gods, bestow them upon people on our side, and eventually make our way to the Fracture and close it before the magical seal wore off and unleashed all of Hell's forces on the planet. Easy enough, but there were 13 gods and only 3 players, so the campaign was really DMPC heavy. Cleric played a… well, a cleric, named Tav. He was secretly a kitsune that had an entire plot-driven character arc that I would have loved to see and is arguably one of the most fleshed out PCs I've ever had the pleasure of playing with. I was invited to the campaign after it had already been going on for about a year by the DM. I had played with them before both with them as a player and a DM, and I knew they were great to work with, so I said yes. The condition they proposed for me was that I play a female character, which is something I've never done before. I still don't know why they encouraged it, especially because of the havoc something as old-fashioned as gender would cause, but I agreed to the term. My first character in the campaign was an elven investigator named Asa. She was a visitor from the elvish lands that came to the country. The fracture had affected the most, to see what she could do to help them frustrated by the indifference of her people. That's how she started out, anyway. Wizard had played in the campaign so far as a peppy human bard with a knack for getting into trouble with the town guards. Wizard was tired of her and wanted to do homebrew stuff for a new character, stating that he wanted to be more DPS than support. The DM allowed it and Wizard created Crane, a name that when spoken will always ruin my mood. Crane was an obnoxious dragonborn sorcerer with a backstory involving massacring his home village and killing his father for a reason that kept changing every time it got brought up. Sometimes it was I felt like it, and sometimes it was he was abusive, but the story was never told the same way twice. He was often drunk and had the fireball first questions last mentality of a murder hobo player that claims to be chaotic neutral. He made this switch shortly after I joined the campaign. Crane had a tendency to hit on Asa every chance he got. His flirting got more serious as he started to give her gifts and shower her in compliments. Crane openly stated that everything he did for her was part of my plan to eventually bed you. Player character romances were never something I had a problem with. They're a lot of fun if done right. But in this case, Wizard and the DM were dating and the DM was not okay with Wizard making Crane chase Asa around like a dog in heat. Neither Wizard or DM had a very good perception of it's just a game. And instead of seeing two characters exchanging some flirty banner for the show, they saw Wizard directly flirting with me. I didn't get the reasoning at the time, but I decided to respect it when the DM told me how they felt. I didn't think it was very in character for Asa to fully accept Crane's advances anyway. In a written interaction between Asa and Crane, Asa stated, I'm flattered, 
but I thought I should just let you know that you have no chance with me. I'd still like to spend time with you, but as friends. We've been through enough as a group to be that much, haven't we? Crane let this crystal clear rejection fly right over his head. And his endeavors went from playful flirting and obnoxious behavior to relentless pursuit. It got to the point where I, the player, was uncomfortable. The last straw was something that I'm not entirely comfortable sharing with the entire internet, but considering our age difference and the way he spoke to me, that's when I realized that maybe, just maybe, Crane's actions towards Asa were actually directed towards me. I went straight to the DM ready to leave the campaign. Instead of letting me just go and getting justifiably enraged at their partner's actions, the DM asked me, do you want to teach him a lesson? I'd known the DM for half a decade at this point, and Cleric and I were going strong as buddies for a solid year. The campaign was the one time every two weeks that we could really talk to each other and have fun because of the long distance between us. If there was a way to get back at Wizard, maybe even get rid of him, without me having to leave behind one of the only ways I could consistently interact with two of my closest friends, I was interested in it. The DM gave me their idea. Let's make Asa evil and tell no one. I didn't really get how making Asa as undesirable as emotionally possible was going to teach Wizard a lesson, but I trusted the DM in their process. All I had to do was have Asa act in such a way that no reasonable person would be attracted to her. Go big or go home. Asa was now a racist, xenophobic snob with enough aggressive nationalist idealism to grow a tiny square mustache. She was no longer in the human territories to help, but to scope out their military strength with the intention of bringing back intel to her father, the king, in order to coordinate an attack plan for genocide. That part had to remain a secret for plot reasons, but I was sure to have Asa slip up and say things that would make anyone unwilling to invite her to any kind of social gathering in case she took it upon herself to bring white sheets. Seasons went from being filled with awkward and uncomfortable sidestepping around Crane so we could get to the plot to intricate espionage missions Asa had to pull off right in front of her unsuspecting party members. She became friends with the human king, his son, and built up a portfolio of vital information that could only be found if Crane or Tav rolled a 15 or higher on an investigation check when going through Asa's things. She had plenty of intel on the humans' defenses and attack strategies, and all she needed was something to convince all the elves back in her homeland that the destruction of humanity was their only hope of survival, so that they would go with her and her father's evil scheme with vigor. The drastic change was strange, and not telling Cleric about all the PMing I was doing with the DM was reproachable, but the gameplay was so refreshing that I was actually having fun again. Being evil wasn't so bad. It really helped me forget how uncomfortable wizards acting through Crane made me. And yet, if Asa said, I hate humans, Crane said, good thing I'm a half-elf. A change in his character made on a whim. I don't understand why the DM allowed it. If Asa said, half, you're one of those blood disease disgraces, Crane would say, oh come on, don't be like that, babe. As blunt as Asa's character changes were, Crane's pursuit of her did not stop, and neither did the messages I got from Wizard. When I brought it up to the DM, they said to play along with them. I guess the DM wanted to see how far their romantic partner would go. The extent to which I followed those orders is something I'm not proud of. I wasn't comfortable with it at all, but the long-running relationship I had with the DM kept me faithful that they would eventually pull through for me, and this arc of the campaign would finally end. It took forever, and I started to feel guilty and tired of all the lying I was doing for the DM. But right as I was at my breaking point, one voice call in a written roleplay session would flip the script. In the voice call session, the party accidentally stumbled upon a hidden royal library that held top secret information from the human crown. There, Asa rolled a nat 20 on an investigation check and found a scroll with a detailed map and plans of how the human army was going to create tunnels underneath the magical barrier holding back the fractious forces straight into the elven city capital and let the forces of hell rip the nation apart while the human race stayed safely hidden behind their walls. It was enough evidence for Asa so that she could bring it back and convince her entire country that the extinction of the human race was the only option. Crane wanted to burn it, saying that wiping out the elves was probably a good idea, just not the method that the human army had planned. I was shocked to hear Crane say that and had Asa remind him that she too was an elf. His defense was that she was different and that he would keep her safe because of their relationship. They'd definitely be official by the time the army could finally do the job. Uh, what? Asa snatched the map and demanded to keep it, her heart racing with anger and fear. This is when Crane thought it would be a good idea to threaten her with his sword. Uh, what? She ran back to the party, consisting of Tav and two DMPCs, screaming for help. Tav quickly defused the situation and made the compromise that the party would take the map straight to the human king, as he didn't seem like the type of guy to be into genocide. Maybe there was someone in the army that made those plans without the king's permission. Once the plan to wipe out the elven nation was brought to the king's attention, he would stop it. 
Asa hid the map within the confines of her clothing, just in case Crane tried to steal it on the way there. And the only thing the wizard had to say about that was, now Crane has one more reason to want to take her clothes off. Ew. The next session was a written one. In it, the party was making their way through a downpour of rain to get back to the capital to tell the king about the plans. When they met a person that was already carrying one of God's blessings, it was the DM's way of progressing the main storyline with the fracture, but they made the mistake of having the blessing carrier be a woman named Dimitri. Crane immediately started to act the same way he did to Asa to her, and the DM was having Dimitri act uncomfortable, but accepting because of her desperate situation. Asa tried to cut in. The girl wasn't human, so it was in her character to care about the girl's safety, but Crane wanted to spend time with Dimitri and made a cheap shot at Asa's lack of skill that was caused by a lot of bad rolls to make her back off. Oh ho ho, Asa took in a deep breath and then let it out slowly, her eyes closing as she tried to collect herself before they snapped open. The elven eyes were nearly gleaming with spite, her brow furrowed deeply as she nearly snarled at him. If this is about the map situation, you can forget about it. You'll see in due time the kind of help that piece of paper will do. You destroying it will do nothing to progress us towards helping the gods. Her demeanor changed, a smug look about her as the snarl turned upwards into a wicked smile. Well, I guess that's what's to be expected. All you do is destroy everything you touch. Consider it a mercy that I keep you from burning anything else, lest you go off and massacre another village. Crane is taken aback and turns to Asa. His hand for a moment leaves Dimitri's and raises up to his sword. He almost wraps his fingers around its hilt before he stops himself. He lowers his hands and gently wraps them around Dimitri's. This time he holds on to them, less to comfort her now, but as an anchor for holding on to his temper. The air around him starts to get hot, but cools down as he focuses on Dimitri's hands. A mercy, is it? Dimitri turns her smile to Tav before she looks down at the floor of the cart, content enough with that answer. She almost looks relieved before her eyes lift to Crane again, then to Asa again, and quickly back to the floor, almost fearful. She makes no comment, but she leans toward Crane eagerly. Hey, it'll be okay, right? Going to the king will solve our problems, won't it? There's no need to fight. Dimitri's mannerisms disarm Asa, and she realizes what she said might have been out of turn. But it's not like she can back out now. Crane had insulted her and actually had the grounds to do it on. That burned her very core to know it was true. So she took a steadying breath, studied the situation before her, and finally decided to get some things off her chest. What's this? You hide behind your newest conquest? Let me guess, you plan on persuading her even after she clearly tells you no as well? As a distraction? Because you're too scared of what you really are to give me a reasonable response? A mercy, is it? She mocked his voice by making hers deeper. Yes, a mercy. You reach for your weapon right there. You pulled it on me back at the library. You obliterate everything we come across. Her rant had become frantic at this point, her hair sprouting from the tie that it was in. Still, the party marched on. And the rain continued to soak them to the bones, sticking their clothes to their bodies, and reveal what they were really made of. Asa's stature was frail and rigid, sharp in places that could cut where it hurts, and starved in places that could never be fulfilled. You're destructive, uncivilized, and have no concept of the way others perceive you. Or maybe you know exactly how others see you and that's why you act like such an egomaniac. No one has ever wanted you, and when they did it was because you were useful. Not because they liked you or genuinely wanted you around, but because you were an instrument to be used as a means to an end. Angry elves with a lawful evil alignment, am I right? Crane slinks back, clearly hurt. For a second, yeah, he thought she was his friend, to a small degree. Sure, he has ulterior motives, but this was something that stung him deeper than he had imagined. He sunk into his seat as the words crossed his mind. You're a tool. Your only purpose is to die so others don't have to. You're worth nothing more than a body on a battlefield, Crane. Your brother understands this. Why can't you? His mind for a moment goes blank. Something in him changes. He gently drops his hand from Dimitri's as his now blank face stares at Asa. His eyes stop being their same brown shades and now stared at Asa with a clear slit in the pupils. Okay. He stands quickly, grabbing onto Asa's tunic with a fury not before seen. The golden claws on his hands dig into the fabric and into her chest a little as he wrenches her from her feet. She tumbles from the wagon onto the muddy ground beneath them. She has only a second to get her bearings before Crane follows up, his fiery yellow eyes not piercing under the shadows of his hat. Unceremoniously, he stomps on her chest to hold her down into the mud. He draws his sword, wreathing it in flames. He speaks, smoke pouring out of his mouth and tears down his face. Go on, talk like him some more. I'm sure he'd love to meet you. Asa hadn't expected for him to prove her right. 
No wind in her lungs, no sight in her eyes, she laid still under Crane's boot for a moment. His words registered slowly, like ooze seeping from an infected wound. The cracking sound that her ribs had made was yet to dawn on her, but the pain that followed rattled her until it shook a scream from her throat. Her breathing was ragged, and she clawed helplessly at Crane's leg, desperately trying to push it off of her. Get- <clears throat> She coughed, and fear began to visibly take hold. She froze under him, eyes wide, when she saw that his weapon was drawn. Wait! Asa stuttered, desperately as she shakily reached down. She plucked the map from within her clothing and tossed it far away from both of them, hoping that giving the scroll up would be enough in exchange for her life. There's a moment of silence, but Crane slides his weapon back in its sheath. His eyes visibly change back to their normal state, and the smoke stops flowing from behind sharpened teeth. He steps off of her and snatches up the map while turning back to the cart. No, you can live with it. He tucks the map into the breast pocket of his vest. He wasn't worthy of my time, and you know what? Neither are you. He walks back to the wagon and climbs in. He sits in the far corner of the wagon, slumping onto the wall and hiding behind his coat and hat. At this point, Tav rushes in and heals Asa, and they all head to a cave to bunker down for the night. Meanwhile, in the real world, Wizard messages me asking if he just blew it with Asa. The DM was celebrating in the PM thread we had, knowing full well that Crane had indeed blown it, doing all the work for them and teaching himself a lesson. I don't know if that really counts as a lesson, because my character was the one that got brutalized, while his is just not getting laid. But I digress. I honestly don't know what he expected. Secretly evil or not, you can't break a girl's ribs and expect her to like you for it. I told Wizard that sentiment, minus the secretly evil part, and he went into an emotional meltdown. He desperately tried to fix things, having Crane approach Asa on his hands and knees, calling himself a monster and begging for forgiveness. Asa, pride and body wounded, gives her statement. You killed your father. You destroyed your people. She stood slowly, weak as her body was, feeling strength throw itself through her veins rapidly as anger flushed her cheeks and ears. You've proven today that you're incapable of controlling yourself. I can't know if you won't do this again. So, Crane. His name was a curse on her lips as she cast it on him. Why should I trust your apology when I can't even trust your temperament? Crane shook his head, the hushed words just barely escaping his mouth. You can't. You can't trust me. I can't trust me. He sits back up, his eyes turned down, and tears still streaming from his face. I just want to right the wrongs I've done, at least make up for it in some way. I left to adventure, to help people to make up for what I did to my home, and all those people, and in one lapse of judgment I threw it all away. I know you can't forgive me, I can't blame you, but you guys, you especially mean a lot to me, and I, I can't live knowing I did everything to hurt you, and nothing to try and fix it. Tears well up in his eyes, more, as he clenches his fists. But I can't anymore. All I'm good for is destroying things. I'm just a bomb waiting to go off, and all I can do is take everything I care about with me. I can't be a hero. I can't fix the things I've broken. I can't earn your forgiveness. He takes this moment to lock eyes with Asa, pleading now for something he knew he was never going to get. Why am I even still here, Asa? Why did God put me, a monster, here if I'm just going to ruin everything? Why didn't I just let him kill me, Asa? Why couldn't I just die? Asa couldn't have said it better herself. She huffed, her body tensed from his rant. She wondered for a moment if he really thought she was that stupid. Why would she fall in line behind a man who could not keep his emotions in check? Why would she bring his honeyed and tear-soaked words into her heart when he had almost crushed it with her own ribcage not a few hours before? Why would she do anything at all? And after I asked the DM and wizard if it was okay to say something really, really dark, I had Asa say, maybe you should have. Even though he has a really dark moment after that, it turns out all right in the end for Crane. He's completely unharmed and doesn't manage to hurt himself. He just went for a really intense jog to get out his angst, like that one scene from Footloose, and Dimitri catches up to him to help before anything drastic happens. Once the party gets back to civilization, Asa gets enough supplies for her journey back home. Tav had picked up the map and given it back to her, and she had made a copy of it with a high sleight of hand check. She offered for Tav to come with her, as she thought they would be better off without Crane, but he refused saying he had to stay and finish his mission to save the gods. One tearful goodbye later, Asa was out of the party and out of my hands. The DM took her over after that and told me Asa would be restatted to be the BBG of the season finale and told me to make a new character, this time a male. I decided to bring back one of my old favorites, an Ifrit barbarian named Ibu, who was on a mission to find his missing daughter when the god of fire thought he'd make a great blessing carrier and he got roped into the party's mess. The weird messages from Wizard didn't stop completely, but they did decrease a substantial amount, as he was suspicious that the DM and I were in cahoots. 
I was able to enjoy the campaign as an honest-to-a-fault barbarian that bullied Crane like an older brother and cut him to the quick when he was being, well, Crane. The party had to enter elven territory to retrieve one of the gods' blessings, and when they were there, they were arrested for not having proper visitation paperwork. They were dragged to a palace where Asa sat on a throne, saying nothing but grinning victoriously as she sent her former party members and my new character to rot in prison. The only one who was surprised was Wizard. Clara had figured out that Asa was evil months before she actually showed back up. Wizard was ticked off and wanted the bloodiest revenge possible on Asa for not sleeping with him and also being evil, I guess. First, they had to get out of the prison. They do that, but on their way out, they overhear soldiers talking that Asa is about to pull an Uno reverse card on the humans and dig a hole under the magical barrier of the fracture, leading directly to the human city capital. The walls surrounding the country would keep the chaos in. The other races would watch helplessly as an entire race came to an end. They had to stop her. Through Ibu the Ifrit Barbarian's eyes, I watched as one of my past characters was defeated, humiliated, and beheaded by Crane. Seeing as she was a horrible person bent on destroying an entire race, it was the fate she deserved, but something about Crane getting to kill her rubs me the wrong way to this day. It definitely didn't help that after he beheaded her, he burnt the rest of her corpse and then carried the head around like a trophy for half a session, creeping out everyone else in the party and setting the mood and power dynamic for the rest of the campaign. It's for the best that the campaign eventually ended, due to a lack of enjoyment and an increase in everyday life business, even if the players never really got a conclusion to the plot. The animosity I still hold for Wizard is something I don't think I can contain for very long, if I ever have to deal with him again. But that campaign taught me a lot about patience and setting my own boundaries that I never forgot. I'm still in touch with Cleric, who's doing great and just graduated college. I'm also still in touch with Wizard and the DM, who are still together for some reason. I hope Wizard grows as a person, eventually, but I guess you can't expect much from the kind of guy that would write an eight page long document of a wish just to make sure he's right. I really wish that Asa had managed to at least kill Crane in the final showdown. I think I would have fudged a few dice rolls, but you live and learn. Please let us know what you think and comment below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things D&D. &D. Our next video will be posted in three days, so stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content.